Hi, and welcome to In Focus. Uh, this is Jabbar Al Ubaidi. In this episode, we'll be covering the post election, the 2020 elections, analysis, understanding. And by the way, we at In Focus, uh, we appreciate everyone who took the time to go and vote. We really appreciate that. This is a great thing. This is how we do uh, our practice, our rights and our uh, democratic rights and, and democracy. So we, we are thankful for everyone. It doesn't matter uh, who, uh, whom you vote or not vote. That's not really our, our job, but we appreciate that. Uh, in this episode, I have with me Dr. Professor uh, Shaheen Muzaffar is uh, Emirates uh, Professor of Political Science at Bridgewater State University in Massachusetts, uh, US. And Dr. Muzaffar is well known for his quantitative and qualitative analysis when it comes to political issues. Also, he is internationally well connected and also uh, locally in the United States is well connected. Uh, he has a very uh, uh, good uh, productive and also meaningful purposeful relation with a lot of uh, uh, departments in, in our country and organization in our country. And I'm very thankful for him to give us uh, some of his busy time to talk about uh, the election 2020. Uh, Dr. Muzaffar, welcome to In Focus. This is the second time we have the honor to have you. Well, thank you very much, Jabbar. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm always help, uh, willing to help uh, do some analysis and clarify some issues that are not usually covered in the press. Uh, thank you. Well, as you know, that's one of my job. Thank you, thank you, and, 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 and this is this is great, and, and, and this is why how you really educate, because it's, I think also about education for future. So tell me first, uh, what's your uh, general uh, reaction uh, to the elections when it's uh, closed on, on November 3rd until today? Well, first reaction is where I will begin where you started. Uh, I think we all as Americans need to be very proud of the fact that we had the largest voter turnout in, a, in over a century, 66, six, almost two thirds of registered voters voted. And that's one of the highest percentage turn, turnout percentage in the last century. And that says something about America's commitment, American's commitment, especially in the middle of the pandemic. While we had a large uh, early voting and mail-in voting, people did wait, wait in line for a long time to vote. So I think we ought to be proud about, uh, about, about that as Americans. Uh, and in that respect, American democracy is relatively stable and, 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 and strong. It's shaky at points in the last four years, as we all know, but I think we, we need to take, take into account. The basic outline of the election results are pretty clear. Uh, despite all the shenanigans uh, launched by Mr. Trump and his supporters, uh, Mr. Biden has won. Uh, and you take a look at the Electoral College, he has already won 306 Electoral College votes. He needs 270. Uh, Mr. Biden, Mr. Trump has won 232. This is exactly the kind of uh, Electoral College vote uh, distribution that occurred in 2016, where Mr. Trump won 306 electoral college votes and Hillary Clinton won 230 votes. So that's, a, that's, a, that's basically settled. Uh, there are some very distinctive aspects uh, that I want to highlight uh, about the distribution of the electoral college votes. Uh, and uh, I've, I've given you some maps that you can show. Yeah, I mean, this uh, one of the map, uh, Professor uh, Muzaffar say, 
electoral college results and you see blue states and you see red states. So what are the, the, the really essential uh, changes in, in this month uh, for our yes. audience? Uh, uh, Arizona uh, was uh, flipped by, by Mr. Biden. Uh, and the deep uh, Arizona went uh, blue uh, in a long time. But the most surprising uh, victory for Mr. Biden was in Georgia. This is in the heart of the red state in the deep south. Uh, and that's actually not very surprising. States like Georgia has been trending blue. In fact, Texas almost became blue. And I think one or two election cycle, it will. But clearly what Mr. Biden had to do, he did. Uh, he flipped Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. So that's all he really needed to flip. But then the surprise was that he flipped also Arizona and also Georgia. So when you add those up, it was a very impressive showing uh, by, by, Mr., uh, by Mr. Biden as a national electoral map. But there are some uh, exception to the rule, but we can talk about that later at the, at the, as, we, as we progress. And I think we need sure. to know that. I also want to note one more thing. Uh, the country is, one of the red lessons here is that the country remains deeply divided. And I have, I have listed uh, st states uh, that, were, that were anticipated to go likely Democratic and likely Republican. So if you take, take a look at that table that I also provided, the country is basically, the, that, has, that is virtually etched in stone for the last several election cycles. So where the competition is in the middle, middle table, and that's where the battleground states, that's where the battleground states are. And if you then flip, and again, this gets back to my first, uh, the pre-election uh, analysis that I did. Uh, so if you take a look at the 2020 results for the battleground states from 2016, Mm -hmm. uh, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Michigan, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Wisconsin. If you take a look at that, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Trump won all those states for, for 2016, but not by not a big margin. But if you then turn to 2020, uh, Mr. Biden won five of them. He won Arizona, he won Georgia, he won Michigan, he won Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. And that was a difference, uh, although the Electoral College votes was in favor of Mr. Mr. Trump. But those five states that Mr. Biden, especially the blue wall uh, in, in, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania and, and Wisconsin, he needed to flip. So those were very good, very good okay. resu results. Yeah, go ahead. What are, let's say, the three, four factors that force this, 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 these changes? I mean, just in, in, in like briefly, what well, are, well, before yeah. you go to deep into this, what yeah. are the one of the things clearly four factors that yeah, really uh, the, the biggest it? factor is that uh, the, the if you take a, take a one one way to think about is uh, that while, while many people are opposed to the electoral college, the way electoral college works and one way to think about how it is working is to see where the candidates are spending most of their money and their time. And you will notice that in the very early stages of the campaign, uh, Mr. Biden spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania, which was his next door. That's where he was born in Scranton. And about halfway through the campaign, it was pretty clear that he was going to win Pennsylvania. Then he, then he focused on Michigan, then he focused um, on Wisconsin. Uh, and, and that was the focus. That's where he did a lot of uh, uh, mobilization, a lot of, lot of campaigning. Uh, he was less successful in doing that in Florida, and I'll talk a little bit about Florida. But what also happened is the mobilization of the African-American vote by Stacey Abrams in the last election, both in the 2016 election where she lost by a narrow margin where a large number of African-Americans came out. And the African-Americans clearly came out in very large numbers in the 2018 election. And that was a crucial, crucial uh, uh, mobilization, mobilization effort that favored Mr. Uh, Mr. Biden. The same thing happened in Nevada and, and in, in, in Arizona. Uh, so in, in many ways, this was a referendum in Mr. Trump. Uh, and to that extent, uh, and as I mentioned last time, it, uh, the negative partisanship is, uh, is very, very, very strong. Uh, and that negative partisanship also helped uh, the, the Democrats win the Senate seat in Colorado and the Senate seat in, in Arizona. So when you put all of these factors together, uh, it was very favorable 
for, for, for the map look variable to, to begin with. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, the electoral college map was not that much of a, of a surprise. A, the Florida was a little bit of a surprise and parts of Texas, which we will talk about. Okay, so, so now for the 2020 presidential election, county level results. So I'm uh, assuming yes. your, your analysis for these three factors you just mentioned, kind of uh, speak to this uh, really very crowded uh, red, a um, little bit white, a little bit, uh, I'm talking about the color of what- Yeah, yeah county level. And the blue. Yeah. So what was well, very condensed? <laughs> yeah, well, most of us focus on um, the media and everybody focuses on the national level election. So what I've been doing lately is to focus on the local local and county level elections. And I will come back to that issue is important to understand is what's happening with the Hispanic vote. So I, I, I just uh, put up that uh, I gave you the map on the county level results and what that shows is that many of the states which are not as competitive is becoming competitive. In the middle of the states, in the middle of the country, you will see that's a pretty straightforward red, red, red states. But we also need to understand those, those states are not very large in terms of population. And so, the, and, but what you also see is that the blue, the Democrats are making inroads in what is normally considered to be a red state, especially in the Midwest, especially in the Southwest in Texas. And this is uh, the, the surprise is, and we have been seeing this trend for the last two or three election cycles. You can see pockets of blue in Texas. It's one reason why some of the Southern states, and let me make this one point, which I think many people have lost, and I'll use Georgia and Texas. I mean, I, I used to live in, the, in South Carolina for a while, and about four or five years ago, I went down to Georgia for a conference, and I was surprised that this did not look like a Southern state when I, when I remember. And the, here is what is happening. Both country states like Georgia, North Carolina, and uh, Texas have become what can be called a modernizing economy. Mm -hmm. It is developing very rapidly. Many of the people working there have moved from the North especially in the research triangle, for example, in, in, North, in North Carolina. And in fact, uh, Houston is now one of the, the country's largest, well, the, the most diverse, uh, uh, diverse city. So what you're seeing here is a classic case of modernization, bringing in middle class, upper middle class, a highly educated people who economically tend to be maybe conservative, but socially and politically tends to be more liberal. And as a result, the irony of it all, and we have seen this sometimes in third world countries where, uh, where countries modernize, but the leader who modernizes the economy eventually pays a price because it creates a middle class. And the middle class, this is what happened in Iran and most of the third world dic dictatorship. This is what has been happening in the red states. People have not noticed that because it is the economic growth and prosperity of the southern states are driving this shift from red, uh, from red states to blue states. And this is what is going to be happening. And this is where the Republicans are so afraid of because they are losing the social battle on, on this, on some of the so social issues. And that's why you see, that's why I like this county maps because it shows you where the Democrats are making inroads uh, with the two exceptions, we can talk about about the Hispanic vote in Southern Florida. Very interesting point. Very interesting point. Then, <laughs> when you go to uh, to the U.S. electoral history, yeah, uh, and 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 in, in light what you just explained to us, yeah, uh, what what do you say about that? Yeah, I I think the one reason I I brought that I I I, I showed that that graph because it shows very clearly that when you have, and this is this graph is about a week old, we are getting more data. And so in the end, I think we're gonna end up Mr. Biden winning anywhere from 80 to 85, 80, 80, somewhere 80 to 82 million votes. But at the same token, Mr. Trump also is, has received the largest number of votes rep, uh, received by uh, Republicans. So we have one of the, these, these, like you said, the single largest voter turnout in the last century. Uh, voter turnout in the United States is one of the lowest of all the advanced industrial co in the, uh, democracies.
but this was uh, was uh, not actually a surprise given what has happened in, in the last four, four years. Mm. Uh, and so I, I thought that was a very a useful piece of information to keep in mind how how dramatic and how unique this this election was. Uh, whether it will continue or not remains to be seen. Yeah, and uh, you know, even uh, in the summary, actually, 2020 election result summary, I think uh, the audience will be kind of very interested in this uh, to understand the numbers because it's, right. you quantified it too. Yes, and well, as you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not a geek, but I, I like to work with numbers because uh, contra contrary to what everybody may say, fake facts, numbers don't lie. Not, the numbers are, <laughs> numbers are, not, are numbers, and that's why I use them to uh, make some analysis. Yeah. But the more important point I want to move to, if you're ready for me to move, besides the summary, the, I, I brought the summary of the election. Those, those are pretty good indicator of the kind of uh, numbers we are looking at. Uh, I, want, I just want to highlight two things. One, that in, while it was good news for the Democrats for winning the presidency, it was not a good news for the Democrats with respect to uh, the House of Representatives. The Democrats lost a net of seven seats and the Republicans won uh, seven seats. And there is a lesson here and a caution, cautionary tale for the Democrats going forward. So what, uh, what, it also, what is the lesson and what's the cautionary? Okay, the, the lesson is that the Democrats need to change some strategy. And this also has to do with the Sp Hispanic vote. And as you know, from my days at Bridgewater, uh, 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 political correctness and I don't get along very well. My, 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 many of my progressive colleagues are going to be very upset with me. One of the things that Democrats have to move away, and you see this particularly in the Hispanic vote, is stop focusing on identity politics. Okay. The need to focus on, e on economic issues. And this is where they lost the Hispanic vote. And this is something that the progressives need to come to grips with. Uh, can, can we hold this, this important point okay. and, and okay. see if we can go to your slide about impact of uh, party, party affiliation? affiliation. Yes. It's, that is to me, one of the most significant data to show how deeply divided the country is. So you have 85% of Democrats voting for Mr. Biden and 91% of Republicans voting for Mr. Trump. This has remained intact for the last 20, 25 years in America mm -hmm. for a long time. And it also accounts for the relative stability of the American electoral system. So you have a small percentage of independents in the middle. And what is important about this independence that independents don't make up their minds until the last minute. In the 2016 election, the independents broke for Mr. Trump, and that's how he won. But this time, the independents broke for Mr. Biden. And so it shows you exactly the division of the country in terms of polarization, but it also shows you the kind of uh, volatility among the independents uh, that could determine uh, the election at the, the, the last minute. Uh, does, that, does that have anything with the, the social uh, demography there? Yes, it, it has. It has to do with the, with the so, social demography because what you see here is clearly the demography that is working uh, here is that the high the education level is is really the the key here and where people live. And, um, where people live in terms of the urban areas, in, and I will show you in, in, in the next next slide. Yes. Uh, and the the demography has worked in a way that overall the movement is towards favoring the the, the uh, Democrats. Uh, and and the, the 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 demographic changes that is happening has not been very good for the Republicans, and I think the Republicans already know that that pretty soon, if they if they keep relying only on the white vote and especially white rural uh, non-college education uh, uh, population. And that is actually declining very rapidly. So in terms of demographics, you see exactly how, how, the, uh, um, how the demographic of the country uh, shapes uh, the party, party distribution. And in the net, the, de the Democrats are, 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 div are gaining from that. So is, the, is that what uh, lead us to what you call it uh, polarization? 
Yes. And probably tribalism or something exactly. like that in the United States. And you see this, and, and you see this, that's why the three, the three issues, the three issues that, uh, that people talked about in the election is the uh, most, problem, most important problem facing the country, for example, or, or the coronavirus. And you'll see how party identification filters the responses. People who think the coronavirus is not under control, 83% of them voted for Mr. Biden. And people who think the coronavirus is under control, 82% voted for uh, Mr. Trump. That's a very intriguing figure and somewhat puzzling figure if you don't understand this demographic and the geography of, of American elections. Where the coronavirus has been surging in the past two or three weeks in, in a month, which is in the Midwest, in the upper Midwest, those states voted heavily for Mr. Trump. And so the net result is uh, people are then making different kinds of calculations of exactly where the coronavirus fits in in the larger scheme of things. And if you ask public, uh, some public uh, for polling says that in the Midwest, for example, people were more concerned about economy than the coronavirus. So they made a choice between if the economy and many of them felt the economy was doing relatively well until the coronavirus hit. The same thing you see in the race problem. 64% of the people who think race is a big problem mm -hmm. uh, voted for the Democratic Party. And 90% of the people who think that race is not a problem in the country, you see them voting for, uh, for, uh, for Mr. Trump. But is this the other, other issue which I think is much more important, the most important problem facing the country? You will see people who, who favor think climate change is an important issue. Racism mm. is an important issue. Coronavirus is an important issue. Yeah. All of those people think voted for Mr. Biden. But those people who think immigration is an important issue and economy and jobs are an important issue, those people voted for Mr. Biden. So what you see is that Political party affiliation shapes and informs and filters the way American voters are assessing the problem and making judgments about the problem. And these three data to me are very good manifestation of the way the American voting public is distributed. So divided. are they, they made this decision based on this, what you call it manifestation. Are they are well educated uh, rounded in terms of understanding yeah, or as a matter uh, okay, of, yes. of follow, follow the emotional aspect of the equation and then you go and show me the line. I mean, uh, just very interesting point you mentioned, Professor, but we want to see if we can put it in context. Yeah. And see how much of, of uh, media literacy, education, and even uh, honestly, uh, political literacy for that. Politics is imp very important. Where is the public from this understanding that you are enlightening us about? I, I think your point is absolutely correct. Uh, combination of education levels and where people get information. Uh, clearly, for the, uh, for the Republican Party, for the Mr. Trump's voters, they tend to get the information from only one source, and that's Fox News. Uh, and some other, like o Owen, for, 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 for example, uh, and there's... Uh, couple more uh, uh, conservative news outlet. Uh, and by and large, those people also tend to be uh, less than college education. They don't have uh, less, than, less than college education. And political literacy clearly becomes an important issue. And so to that extent, uh, much of the voting takes place of how people react in the gut emotionally, how, how they're feeling not in any kind of rational calculation of weighing out policy options uh, because people don't spend that much time on politics and policy options tend to be very complicated. And this has been a very long standing uh, uh, issue in American politics. And the fact that we also have media, you know, it's very difficult for, for any, even the mainstream media to convey complex, complex policy issues in a 10 second, 15 second soundbite. And so the net result is, and we know from other research and you are more qualified as, a, as an specialist in communications, that those people who receive 
information through the television, which is about 80, 82% of the population, have less information about context than people who receive information through the magazines, through journalism, and uh, to, by reading the newspapers. Uh, and, and only about if you have 80 to 84 percent of the people receiving uh, information through the television, the amount of knowledge and the amount of information they have is, is limited uh, and because that's not, that's not what the medium is. And it, as somebody who grew up in the 70s, uh, Marshall McLuhan used to say, the famous social critic, the medium is a message. Remember, I, I remember that, right? Yeah. That's how old I am. No, no, you are young. You're still young. So, so this is uh, actually lead us to the 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 point that we postponed uh, is about the Latino electorate and the elections. And there is a general sense that immigrants in general they favor uh, the Democrats. Uh, the, but it, it seems to me is you, you show us something different here. Yes. Um, I wonder what's your uh, analysis yes. to that and, yeah, and, this, and the reasons. Yeah, this is when I get into trouble with my progressive uh, friends and <laughs> multicultural friends. Look, I said that before. Uh, by, overall, immigrants did vote for Mr. Biden, that the majority of them did. But I think we have to be also careful why did they vote that? They may be, they may be voting for a variety of reasons. And I'll just use the Hispanics because they're the, they're the fastest growing population um, electoral votes. So if you take a look at the data, they've got about 13, 14% of the, of the, of the electoral, of, of, the, of the electorate. And, if you, and where they're concentrated is also important. And I want to focus on that. They concentrate in New Mexico, California, Texas, Arizona, Florida. And so there are about 32 million eligible Latino, Latino voters. And there's a very nice article that came out several weeks ago that there is no such thing as a Latino vote. What that means is that we have a tendency incorrectly to treat the Latino as one mono, monolithic homogeneous block. Excellent and, point. Yes. And so I want to focus on that because this is the future. Uh, of, this is where some of the battle, electoral battles will take place. And on this particular issue, the Democrats did not do a good job on this. And I'll, I'll give you two of, my, two of my favorite examples, Texas. If you take a look at Texas, particularly in the deep south on the Rio Grande Valley, uh, and the Latinos are approximately third of the electoral, uh, electoral votes. And the map I gave is a very good map of showing in Hidalgo County and in Star, in the Star County around Laredo area. So if you now take a look at what has happened in Texas, and New York Times had a very nice uh, map. So there is a map which, it, which I showed the geography of the 2020 vote. If you take a look at the arrows, all those arrows going red voted for Mr. Trump. Mm. And all those arrows which going blue voted for Mr. Biden. But what is important about that, take a look at where you have to know a little bit about Texas to know that. Much of the blue arrows are in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Some of them are in Houston area. But what is important is West Texas, uh, El Paso and East, and around Laredo and McAllen. The Laredo McAllen area is particularly important because this is the Rio Grande Valley. This is right on the Rio Grande River, right across from uh, Mexico. Uh, and, and then if you, if you then take a look at the next graph, which I think even more powerful, is that if you take a look at the right-hand side, uh, or even the le left, uh, the, the middle uh, uh, level, more college-educated people voted for Mr. Biden. And fewer college-educated voted for Mr. Trump, and you can see the red arrow. Mm -hmm. But my mm -hmm. favorite uh, graph is the right-hand graph, where it says share of the population that is Hispanic in the county level. And if you take a look at that, every more Hispanic is at the top of the graph and less Hispanic is in the bottom of the graph. Mm -hmm. And the more Hispanic a county has, the more it votes for Trump. And there's, there are several reasons why I think we need to, we need to understand that. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I would like to hear this, the reason why. Yes. Okay, so who are these voters? And I'll talk a little, little bit about, uh, about Hispanics in Southern Florida because they're a different group because they've got a lot of especially Cuban Americans and they, they, they always tend to be conservative. But I want to focus on the Texas issue. 
they all happen to be rural, they're low income and lower education. They're relatively high unemployment rate, except for the recent oil boom uh, because of Trump policy. Most of them also tend to be small business owners and they have been hurt by the pandemic shutdown. So if you add those kinds of characteristics up and then they're also socially conservative, they're deeply religious, and they're also Catholic. See, this is what we tend to forget. They're deeply religious, they're socially conservative, they're Catholic, anti-abortion, anti-gay. So if you add those four characteristics, their socioeconomic profile is very much like the socioeconomic profile of the white Trump voters in the Midwest, except for ethnicity. The only problem is when we in the, particularly when we live in a blue state bubble, and we do live in a blue state bubble and in, in, in other diverse communities in the East and the West, when you talk about racism, racism does not resonate with these people in, in, in these counties because 95, 96% of these people are all Hispanics. So racism is not an issue for them. To them, it is economic that is an issue. And by and large, they tend to favor Mr. Trump on economic issues especially the way they have been hurt in a small business, then you add the social, social, uh, the, the, the social and cultural factors that are deeply religious. One other issue, again, climate change is not an important issue for them. Now, one, of the, one would think that border wall is an issue. Well, these folks are very pragmatic because they know that the border wall has not been completed and it will not be com completed. <laughs> so, 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 so to them, these issues that is more important, and border wall, by the way, is an is an important issue for population in the Midwest, far away from the border. It is an important issue. They favor uh, the, the border wall, uh, the Trump voters in the Midwest. So for those of us who live in the blue states, in our own bubble in the South, Northeast and in California, we obviously are opposed to the border, border wall. So you see the pattern here. If you're away from the border, you're either opposed to the border wall or favor the border wall. But these folks who are living next, right on the border, they know the border wall has not been completed. Mm -hmm. So they're making some very pragmatic decisions. And you can see the same kind of logic operating with the Hispanic population in Southern Florida, where they have, especially in Dade County, uh, which Hillary Clinton won by a large margin and Biden uh, barely won. And that really cost him uh, the, the electoral college votes in Florida. So, so professor for, uh, you know, Voting and public policy, you have this very, we use this um, in, in one of the interviews. Uh, so explain this, and this should take us to the main challenges for the president-elect Joe Biden from your perspective. So would you shed some light on this, please? Yeah, this is one of the things uh, I, I, in fact, I may have cited in one of, there's a very good book out of people interested in reading called Democracy for Realists, Why Elections Do Not Produce Responsive Governments. It is simply because the American system is not designed as a, at the aggregate level. And that's why I have the draft to show that policy is made between negotiation between Congress and presidents. And much of the policy is made there. So let me, address some challenges. Uh, the first challenge that the Biden administration will face will depend on the, the Georgia election uh, in, in Georgia, to the Senate elections. If, if the Democrats win both elections, they will have a majority because they will have uh, Vice President Kamala Harris sitting in the chair as, uh, as breaking the tie vote. If the Republicans win only one seat, they will have a majority. So it is imperative that the, Mr. that the Democrats win both seats to make life a little bit easier. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is that the Democrats majority has narrowed, which means many of the progressives have lost. And most of them who lost the Democrats were progressives, mm -hmm. which means with that narrow majority, it'll be very difficult for the moderates who to, to support progressive policies. And already we are witnessing some internal fight to, for what is known as the leadership of the Democratic Party. And that will, that, that, that will come. So right off the bat, uh, one can, we can say that progressive policies are endangered and not very many of these will be, will be passed as we had envisioned. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the immediate crisis of the pandemic and the economy. That will take up a lot of time 
for Mr. Biden's administration. And once that has, unless those two things are not resolved, nothing else is going to happen. So progressive policy is immediately getting diminished. Having said that, the area where there can be bipartisan support is on infrastructure policy. And if I could just say one thing about infrastructure, everybody likes infrastructure because every single congressional district benefits from infrastructure. And the famous story back in when Reagan was president, he was opposed to any government spending. Congress passed $87 billion infrastructure highway bill. He vetoed it, but the veto was overridden, including some of his own supporters voted to override the veto because every single congressional district got some money. This is a safe bipartisan policy that can be passed in the short run by the Biden administration. It'll, it'll also produce jobs. Uh, so when you put all of these two things together, uh, uh, Mr. Biden's governance aspect uh, becomes very challenging. Having said that, if you have heard the news this morning, if you take a look how he has gone about appointing the five or six people in the national security, uh, everybody is saying these are very boring people because most people have not heard of them, but they're extremely competent they are there to send a message, not, domestic, not only domestically, but to the rest of the world, that very competent people are now going to be in charge of experience and competent people. So Mr. Biden is making all the right moves right now going forward. And, and in view, and that, that's a very appropriate move to make because next week after Thanksgiving, we'll get some additional appointments to some of the domestic uh, some of some the other departments will give us a hint uh, about indication of how Mr. Biden is going to govern. And given these challenges, uh, it will not, uh, it will not, it will be challenging. Uh, but I think given his experience and the kind of pre, uh, indication that the kind of people he'll be bringing in uh, may help him down, down the line. Emer's Professor uh, Shaheen Muzaffar political science, Bridgewater graduate state university, an expert on these issues. Thank you so much for your insight, uh, your thoughtful uh, analysis, and uh, please enjoy uh, the holiday with your family, stay safe, and hopefully we'll have you uh, sometimes uh, over probably uh, in spring to talk more about this and, and, and put them uh, probably in contrast what we, you, you analyze. Uh, and thank you for watching in focus. We'll see you in next next week.